Well, good good morning. Um, my name is Kurt Bombeck, if you don't know me. Um, so that was just a blessing to, to be with Mr. Hazen yesterday. And uh, he always keeps you on your toes. So um, last week, if you weren't here, and I was real disappointed with Emery because he didn't let it record it. But at the very end, he talked about that the reason that he stayed at the church was because this church is based on the word of God. And the words that he used, I have it written down here, inerrant, infallible, and inspired. You know, and in Proverbs 35, it says, every word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who, t to those who take refuge in him. And, uh, you know, I'm glad to be part of a church that is based on the word of God, that it is perfect, it is unchangeable. And, you know, uh, the other thing about this church that I love is our mission statement comes right from Jesus, that we, you know, we preach, we teach, we baptize, and we make disciples. So the making disciples part is hopefully I'll do a good job at that today and encourage you and, and I can learn from you too. And uh, one, of the, one of the favorite verses that I think about the word of God is in John 1.14. It says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. So. <clears throat> We can always, as in Proverbs, we can take refuge in our God, in Jesus, because through the Old Testament and the New Testament, it all points to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I was going to do a little bit of a review to get up to chapter 26. So in, in Matthew 21, the chief priests questioned Jesus' authority and want to know where it comes from. But Jesus asked him a question. He says, well, if you can tell me if John the Baptist came from God or came from heaven, then I'll tell you, well, what did the, what did the Pharisees do? They didn't know or they wouldn't answer because they were afraid of the people, right? So later in the parable of tenants, Jesus talks about, you know, that this, um, this father made a vineyard and then he hired tenants to take care of it. So when harvest came, he sent his two servants. He sent servants twice and then he sent his son. And what did, what did the tenants do to, do to the people? They killed them, you know, and they even killed his son. And at that point, the Pharisees sort of figured out what? That they were talking about them. The Pharisees figured out that Jesus was pointing right at them. And then in Matthew 22, they try to trap Jesus, and they talk about taxes. So what was the thing that the religious religious leaders and the Pharisees tried to trap him about taxes. Paying taxes, well, they showed him, uh, you know, they said, well, should we pay taxes or to Caesar or pay tax, you know, or should we pay, give our money to God? And he came out and he, he, he showed him a coin and they said, who's, who's on the coin? Caesar. And he says, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's and give unto God what is God's. So all of, all of them were amazed, and that didn't work out too good for them. So um, after that, they took a Pharisee, and they asked Jesus what was the greatest commandment. And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. And the Pharisees said, you were right. Okay, so they agreed with him. And the Pharisees were, were still trying to trap 
Jesus, but they came to a point where after that, that they decided that they would, they just decided that they weren't going to ask him any more questions because every time they asked them, they got shut down. They, they couldn't verbally take on Jesus. So in Matthew 24 and 25, Jesus' disciples come to him privately, and, and we talked about the signs of the times, and they want to know what that means. So when we get up to chapter 26 is when Jesus is finishing explaining to his disciples about what the signs of the times were. So starting in Matthew 26 is where I was supposed to start. Is And, and uh, I'm reading from the NIV, so it's Matthew 26, 1 through 2. It says, when Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, as you know, the Passover is in two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. So do you, so do you think the disciples sort of understood what he was saying? No, no. Was this the, was this the first time that Jesus explained that he had to die? No, and just earlier, we probably studied this in Matthew 17, 22 through 23. When they had come together in Galilee, he said to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill them, and on the third day, he will be raised to life, and the disciples were filled with grief. Well, they were, they were sad, but they didn't get it. You know, um, I'm going off script a little bit, but as raising kids, I remember telling my son or daughter something about six or seven times, and, you know, they didn't get it. They they just went back, and they didn't get it, you know, and, and the disciples were like that, too, and, and I think I think we can't be too hard on the disciples, because I can think of, of uh, certain sins of my youth where all of a sudden I didn't. I didn't get it, you know, and sometimes, um, sometimes God had to use like a two by four by the time I got it, you know, you know, so I don't think we should be too hard on, on the disciples. So in Matthew 26, three and four, it says, then the chief priest and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, who name was Cepheus. And they schemed to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or there may be a riot among the people. So the chief priests and the religious leaders tried again and again to trap Jesus. And they couldn't, they couldn't get it done. And they, at a point, they weren't even going to ask him any more questions because they were tired of getting shut down. And, and in here, why didn't they want to have it during the, during the Passover time, during the festival time? Right? They were, they were afraid of the people. So, so what did they do? They schemed. So what, what, does that, what does that mean? I looked up in the dictionary. It's like it's something that. You know, as a as a child, I think I would I, I thought that was a good word. I would scheme. They plot it together in secret, in secret, conspiring, crafty, dishonest. Yeah, yeah. Uh, who who's crafty? Who who? Satan. Satan was very crafty in what he did, starting, starting with Eve. You know, he tricked her. So, but they didn't want to do it during the festival. But when was Jesus arrested? It was, it was before. It was before the Passover, right? It was Thursday night. 
And I, I was thinking about that. Well, actually, I was reading it in, you know, in my study Bible. Is that that showed that it wasn't their time. It was, it was God's time. You know, so even though they were planning, they were going to do it after, God had a plan, and that's, that's the way it worked. So the other thing about schemed when I looked up, it said make plans, especially in a devious way, with intent to do something illegal and wrong. So I'm not going to go into the, the arrest part. I'm not going to get that far today. But was anything about the arrest of Jesus Christ legal? No. No, if you went, you know, the next guy that teaches when they study into that, they did it, at, they did it secretly at the dead of night because they, it wasn't legal what they were doing. So, when we're talking about the Pharisees and the religious leaders, who, was, who, was, who did Jesus accuse them was their father? Satan. Satan. So, so it, you know, did that sort of please the religious leaders? You know, it's, it's like he wasn't, you know, it's like um, when I was a kid, you know, you liked to poke at a snake. You know, you know that's probably not a good analogy. But you know, the 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 Pharisees didn't. You know, Jesus just well, this you know they you know he called them a brood of vipers. So maybe that is a good analogy. But Jesus kept on poking at them. You know, and as it says in John eight forty four, it says, "You belong to your father, the devil." And you want to carry out the Father's desires. He is a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. There is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So, the Pharisees were doing their father's bidding. They wanted to get rid of Jesus. And why did they why did they want to do that? You know, they saw the miracles. I, I was wondering, it's like, you know, why, you know, they, they saw Lazarus get raised from the dead. They tried to hide it. They, they saw the miracles. What was more important to the Pharisees? Power. Power. Yeah, they were... They were afraid of Jesus. Yeah, and others said they, they just wanted power, you know, and, and uh, you know, and I would always think is like, how stupid are these guys? You know, he, he raised somebody from the dead, you know, he, he did all these things. He could, he could if, he, if Jesus wanted to hurt them, he could have, but he, but he didn't, Cause, you know, because that, that wasn't his purpose. In Mark, it talks about, you know, the Son of Man did not come to serve, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for everybody. I paraphrase that a little bit. But, Tommy says she poked a snake and it chases you. All the way to your house. So. Oh, that that's a really good point. That as as um, Tommy is saying, is 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 Satan is a snake. You know, he was a snake in the Garden of Eden, and if you poke a snake, he'll chase after you. And there, there's a good point of that. Is like. You know, there's like certain things you shouldn't be around as Christians, and if you and if you and if you keep on poking on them, or you keep on looking at them, or being close to him, they're gonna chase after you, right? You know, and Satan. You know, we're we're praying this morning at staff meeting, praying for our staff, because you 
Do you think that Satan isn't after the staff of the Rock Church or the body of the Rock Church? You know, because why is Satan after us? Because we're a threat. So is that much different than, than what the Pharisees thought, the threat of Jesus? It's, it's no different. And, and there's still people that, yeah, I don't, I don't want to get into it, but there's certain people on TV that care more about power, and they do it in the name of Jesus Christ, but they only care about their power. They care about money, you know, and that... What I love about the Rock Church is, uh, go ahead, go first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, sh I should have kept my thought first because now it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, Alice says we know. But, but we have to realize is, is if we're in the trenches for Jesus Christ, Satan is going to get after us. You know, I remember when Pastor Jim first came and I was, back then it was like a advisory board. And he said, you know, you guys have to realize that Satan is going to go after you. You know, and... Uh, all right, let me get back to Matthew 26, 6 through 8. Why Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper. So I, I want to stop right there. So he's in a home of a leper. So what do you think about this leper? He, he, was, a, he was probably healed by... Yeah, he... Yeah, they wouldn't allow him to be in his home. So I was thinking, you know, was he one of the ten that came back and, and praised God for healing him? I don't, I don't know that, but I, I thought that. So while Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leopard, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of a very expensive perfume, which she poured on the head, on his head as he was reclining at the tables. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. The perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. So in John, it specifically states which disciple brought up this complaint. And who do you think it was? Judas. So what was Judas's job? Take care of the money. Take care of the money. So that's why it's really important that Pastor Wes or I or Pastor Todd, we have no idea who gives what. And it needs, it needs to stay that way because we shouldn't make, be making decisions on treating somebody different because they give the money. So... So to, to back that up, I always like to back up whatever I say. In John 12, 4 through 6, it says, But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. And he did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. So Judas, as he betrayed Jesus, who is he taken over by? Satan. And what is Satan? Father of lies, and he's a thief. You know, he's trying to steal. He's trying to, as Christians, I, I think when, when the joy is taken away from us for, for something stupid, like, I'll, I'll use a stupid example. It's like, if I lose my keys, I'm, I'm, I'm mad all day. But that's a stupid example. But Satan, if we allow him, can steal our joy. He's a, he's a thief. You know, and there's, and there's other things about, um, you know, we can, we can worry about our health. You know, we, you know, um, we went through and... Um, 
we we can be concerned about things that we we need to let to be in God's hands. You know, I was just thinking I didn't pray, and I want to do that. I'll stop right now and do that because I didn't. I always do that. So this is a good time to do that. So we're going to pray for Dick Hazen, and we're going to pray for uh, Glenn, Gene and Gene and Glenn, that um, Glenn has um, uh, cancer lung cancer, and we're going to pray for the Israel trip. So I was going to take any other prayer requests. Pardon me? Kim and Dan, yeah? Anything else? Sue? October 30th. So I'm going to blame this not praying, praying at first on Mr. Hazen because he goofed me all up. Anything else? Reg- Rigdon. Yeah, I'm so trying, I want to make I pronounce that right. Rigdon. All right. Let me pray. Father, we just, uh, we just uh, thank you for uh, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and in whose name we come and bring these prayer, prayers to you. We just praise you for the, the good news about Rigdon. We pray that you would continue to help this little baby. Lord, uh, uh, it, this just is a miracle of God that you've done, and we pray that you would use him as he grows. We pray for Brian as he's having back surgery October 30th, that you'd be with that, calm uh, his heart and Sue's heart. And uh, we pray for Rich and, and Mary Ann, that you'd be with them. We pray for Kim and Dan as Dan goes through uh, cancer treatments, that you would just uh, be there. We pray that, uh, that this uh, chemo would take away the cancer. We pray that you would heal him. Uh, we pray for Glenn, who has... Um, lung cancer, that you would just be with Jean and help her as, as she cares for her son and takes her to the treatments, and that you would heal him. And uh, we just thank you and praise you for Mr. Hazen, for what a, for what a, a good encouragement he is. And, and Lord, we thank you for him. And, and Lord, uh, on this Saturday, um, uh, there's a team of people going over to Israel. I pray for safety. I pray that they'll have a great time. And and that you would just uh, encourage them, and that they, uh, with this trip, that they go stronger in you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So next time I forget to pray at first, you guys can yell at me. Tommy says I can't have a donut now because I forgot that. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <sighs> All right, so so I think I ended up with Judas complaining about the money and the perfume. So in Matthew twenty six ten through thirteen, aware of this, Jesus said to them, "Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing for me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me." When she poured the puf perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. So this woman was the Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. So why did she pour this perfume on Jesus' head and in another gospel, she also poured it on her feet and she took her hair and she wiped it with it. So why did she do that? To anoint him for what? For burial. So again, Jesus says this to the disciples, but they don't, they don't get it. They don't get it. So the disciples still aren't understanding. 
So in Matthew 10 through 13, 26, 10 through 13, it says, Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest. So this is after they left the house. So after this, I was, I'll read this first. So then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and asked, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand it over. So do you think Judas was mad because of that perfume? And that sort of like put him over the edge a little bit? Or he he was just always going to do this? He's just always going to do this, Jinx says. Yeah. Yeah, Judas always had that greed. Is that something that we need to fight against? I do. I do. You know, how often do we look at our 401k? Well, I haven't looked at it for a while lately, but for obviously reasons. But that that was unnecessary. So, um, <laughs> so, Judas cared more about money than anything else. And, he, and from that point, he was looking at the opportunity. So, does the Old Testament prophet point to this? Was this, was this prophesized? Yes. Yes, it was in, in uh, the Old Testament prophet Zechariah, did I pronounce that right, states, if you think it best, give me my pay, but if not, keep it. So they paid him 30 pieces of silver, and the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter. So after Jesus hanged himself, and he was remorse and hanged himself, and he gave the money back to the uh, Pharisees, what did they do it? do with that money? They gave it to Potter's Field to bury those that had no, had no money to be buried. So God had this plan from the beginning and to what Jinx was saying is that Judas was probably always like this because that was God's plan. But I think it, but I think it was Judas's choice. He, you know, but God knew he was going to be like that. So in Matthew 26, 10 through 13, it says, On the first day of the unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparation for those for you to eat the Passover? He replied, Go into the city to a certain man and tell him, The teacher says, My appointed time is near. I'm going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared for the Passover. So I always thought that sort of weird. It's like he, he just told the disciples, go find this man. So what, what was another time where Jesus just said, go to this man? And it was like a week ago from this time we're talking about. Yeah, go get the donkey. You know, it's like, so, you know, I was always thinking the disciples were thinking, well, is this guy going to think I'm going to steal the colt or, or, or what? But the guy gave the colt. So it was all in God's plan. And, and one of the uh, commentaries I was reading is, is, do you think Judas knew about this, where they were going to do the Passover? I have the time. I don't, I don't think so, because then, then he would have probably told the chief priest. Right, right. I, I, 
Right. It would, you know, Jenks said it would have been easier. That would have been easier than what happened because then they, you know, they had a bunch of soldiers. They had a bunch of people out. It was more of a, a spectacle. So Jesus had it all planned out. So in Matthew 26, 20 through 25, it says, When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him, one after another, Surely you do not need me, Lord. Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. So the Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to the man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he was not born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. And Jesus answered, You have said so. So Judas knew so Jesus knew that he was going to betray Jesus, but did that did that bother him at all? You know, Jesus like pointed him out. Did it bother Judas to, that Jesus knew? You think it did? I, I still did it. You know, you know he didn't he didn't care that Jesus knew. So when did when did he care? When did he care about it? After yeah, after he saw that they whipped him and what they did to him. I didn't think he I didn't think he realized what they were going to do to Jesus. Yeah. Did did you think did you think Judas knew that? that they were going to crucify him? I don't, I don't think so. You know, and, you know, as we, uh, as we get ready to do communion, you know, one of the things we need to, we need to think about is, you know, the suffering and the pain that, that Jesus went through to save us. You know, Jim. Jim, Jim said, that's a, that's a really good point. I never thought about that, is that why didn't the other 11 disciples, like, beat him up? <laughs> Here first and then Greg. Okay, so what was what was said because the way they reclined that the other disciples might not have heard that. What were you gonna say, Greg?
Um, right. Right, right. What what Greg was saying is that Judas saw it was with Jesus the whole time. He saw the feeding of the five thousand. He, you know, he 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 was there when um, Peter declared him the Christ, the Messiah. But yet his heart was so hardened that he thought he was doing what is right. You know, and I I think I think we see that going on today a little bit with the persecution of Christians, you know, the, you know, the, you know, the, um, you know, some of the, the killings over in the Middle East and stuff, you know, they think they're doing what is right because their heart is hardened, you know, just, just like Pharaoh, you know, and, uh, that's, that's sort of a hard thing for me to think of because, you know, um, because it's sort of sad is that people can be offered the gospel many, many times. But the Bible teaches at a certain point, you might not get another chance, you know, because, it, it, you know, it says today is the day of salvation, you know, and you've heard Pastor Wes, you know, preach that from, from the pulpit. So, good point. Tommy. You know, uh, Yeah, and James and John. So Tommy said the disciples just didn't get it. I think they were still thinking that Jesus was going to set up his kingdom and overthrow the Roman government. Yeah, they, they were thinking of him as a, a king, and that's not what Jesus at this time came to do. He will come as a warrior. Um, but that's a good point. The disciples just didn't get it. And the, you know, even, even James and John, you know, they like, like, well, can, you know, the mom, you know, we always pick on the poor mom that, you know, can this son sit on the right hand and my other son sit on the, on the left, you know, and, and what did all the other disciples at that time when they heard that they were all what mad, you know, they were indignant, you know, so. Because they, yeah, yeah, if they heard them. So I'm going to move on because I want to make sure we have time to do communion. And I guess I better get a communion cup here. Do we have extra ones here? Oh, okay. So what I was going to do before I go on is because I don't know about you guys, but I have such a hard time opening these things. So just open it enough so you can get the wafer out. And then open it so you can get the drink. All right, let me know when everybody's got that and we'll move we'll move on. Okay, so in Matthew 26, 26, it says, Why they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. So this is the Passover feast. So at this time, Jesus is transforming the last Passover meal that he would take into the first 
observance of the Lord's Supper or communion. So the communion was for his disciples, and communion for now is still for his disciples. It's for believers. It's not for non-believers. So um, I guess that's all I'll say about that here, because I'm assuming everybody in here is, is a believer. And um, so in 1 Corinthians 11, it states that we ought to examine ourselves. So if, if we had something against the brother, should we take communion? No. If, if we have a sin that's unconfessed, should we take communion? No, we need, to, we need to take care of that first. So let's just take, a, take a, a short minute and just examine ourselves and, and uh, see if God would, would open something to our heart. So in 1 Corinthians 11:24 it says when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me So let us take the bread remembering the suffering and the broken body of Jesus and what he had to suffer for us <laughs> So in Matthew 26, 27 through 29, then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I will drink it new with you from my Father's kingdom. So let's drink this cup, remembering the blood that Jesus shed for the forgiveness of our sins. So I was thinking, I'm sorry, Who's going who's gonna to teach the class in November? I forgot your name. So you're probably going to talk a little bit about that we're not going to drink this cup that with Jesus until we're in the Father's kingdom. And, uh, you know, I, I think as we, at that point, we drink it now remembering what Christ did for us. But when we drink it in the kingdom, we'll be drinking it and rejoicing that we're with our Savior, Jesus Christ. So Matthew 26, 31 said, When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So we are going to do a hymn if the somebody... Oh. So I'm going to shut my mic off because... I'm kind to you. <laughs> 